please join me here in welcoming Professor Sevasco. Thank you very much. No, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, of course, I would like to start by thanking the organizers of this symposium for inviting me over. And I'm very happy to be here to celebrate the award of the Hobart Prize to Frederick Jameson. Uh, the name of my paper is Criticism, a Political Issue. We begin to think where we live. I teach cultural studies at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. This location on the periphery of global capitalism, where the contradictions of this iniquitous system appear in their most unequivocal materialization, demands a peculiar engagement from intellectual work. This engagement gets translated in the desire to think beyond the limits of our impelling situation. The same engagement changes the method itself of doing cultural criticism. The focus of interest is on the way in which elements of social reality structure cultural products. The analysis of how those external elements become internal, that is, how the contents of history become a static form, can then reveal dimensions that exceed the reigning ideology or the artist's conscious intentions. Adapting a formulation of Antonio Cândido, the initiator of a Brazilian tradition of dialectical cultural criticism, in countries like ours, more than exclusively a labor of a static evaluation, criticism tends to become an instrument for discovering and interpreting social reality. As Roberto Schwartz, who continued the tradition and elaborated its world historical consequences, puts it, if criticism does not decipher, investigate, construct, refuse appearances, if it does not consubstantiate difficult intuitions, it's not criticism. Its end result is not the simple reiteration of everyday experience. On the contrary, criticism opposes the prepotency of daily experience, explicates its contradictions, highlights its tendencies. As such, criticism has a decisive power of clarification. The spirit is the same in both formulations. Criticism should use its unique cognitive capacities to review social reality as a means of intervening in its course. I was formed in this intellectual milieu, and this accounts in part for the impact of my first reading of Frederick Jameson. As those intellectual encounters go, my first contact with his work was in the mid-80s, 1980s. I was in Britain carrying out research for a doctorate uh, in English literature on the fate of realism in postmodernity. Little did I know that these were going to be lifelong preoccupations in what was to become my real object of studies, namely Jameson's work. But to go on with the story, back then, I was aghast at the turn cultural criticism was taking. Following the powerful cry from France, Il n'y a pas d'or text, most of the bibliography I read, yeah, <laughs> I agree, most of the bibliography I read and the professors I talked to were all revamping formalist analysis in sophisticated philosophical terms. There did not seem to be any interpretative gains in the move. To my mind, those professors were actually going back to a, an unnecessarily limited version of textuality, as if by a fiat of intellectual retreat in the face of the unfulfilled high hopes raised by the 1960s, literature could be explored simply as a matter of texts that concerned other texts, which were thus stripped of history and of social significance. It was amidst this ocean of irrelevance that I came across Jameson's The Political Unconscious, first published in 1981. At first reading, the book already stood out as a signpost that changes intellectual directions. 
you will remember it is deliberately constructed against the grains of times that paradoxically combine sophisticated mental schemes with intellectual enfeeblement. The political unconscious, and I was going to learn this later, configures the typical Jamesonian move, that is, an intervention in an intellectual debate that changes the terms of the debate itself and recombines those terms in a new paradigm that forces the debate to reckon with the new challenge. And here, it might be useful to remember that those discursive struggles are more significant than their present-day confinement in academia suggests. What is at stake is more than which new ism is going to win the day. Those discourses imply what we used to call Weltanschauungen and have a bearing on how we make sense of the world and of determinations we did not choose. So, when critics back then were declaring the impossibility of interpretation, they were denying the possibility of making sense, not only of works of art and of philosophy, but of our whole way of life. And then, here was this sophisticated intellectual, conversant in all the academic language and fashion, who writes a book which unabashedly is about the age-old practice of hermeneutics. The political unconscious begin by asserting that history itself is the ground and untranscendentable horizon of interpretation. In a sentence that seems to acquire more and more significance as time passes, Jameson states that history is what hurts. It is what refuses desire and sets inexorable limits to individual and collective praxis. He adds that we may be sure that history's alienating necessities will not forget us, however much we might prefer to ignore them. As for the discursive struggle, the, the book brings together different interpretive codes and soon zooms them in precisely that thing the reigning doxa denies, that is, a new strong theoretical discourse. The name Jameson gives elsewhere for this fundamental operation that enables such construction is transcoding, and Professor Paik talked about transcoding in his paper. That is, the rewriting of different theories, not as a mean to achieve some sort of all-encompassing synthesis, but as a transformation mechanism that allows us to move from one theoretical paradigm to another and use their specific forces of clarification without being constrained by their frameworks. You will remember that the most obvious codes translated in the political unconscious are structuralism and psychoanalysis, as represented by levi Strauss' notion of narrative as the symbolic resolution of a real social conflict and Freud's analysis of the mechanics of dreams. What does not register in the narrative apparatus is precisely what we should look for and hence the positing of a narrative unconscious, which is the job of interpretation to unearth and inquire. As the ground for the coordination of those two traditions, there is Georg Lukacs' demonstration of the political usefulness of narratives as a means of counteracting the forces of segmentation that control social life and individual consciousness under capitalism. Those forces work effectively to suppress both our personal and collective ability to make connections and grasp totality. Narrative, which is a concrete expression of human experience in history and depends on process and connections, has in this situation a greater epistemological value when compared to more abstract and philosophical modes of understanding. Narrative analysis in this new enhanced sense is a potent instrument for discovering the contradictions that determine social life. By the gist of those cursory remarks, you can surmise that by the second or third reading, it's not an easy book, I was beginning to grasp the significance of the first sentence of the political unconscious, always historicize. So I was beginning to understand this for what it was, that is the motto for a whole intellectual project perhaps the most ambitious intellectual project in contemporary cultural criticism. 
And as years passed and I read book by book, I began to realize that the project is nothing less than to revitalize the great tradition of the dialectics and equip it to face the tasks the historical moment demands. And of course, the question that imposes itself at this point is, what are the tasks required of the thought of the future in times like ours, marked by the eternal presence present of the commodity form? In an article that is, his, that is going to be reprinted is his 20th book, Valences of the Dialectics, scheduled to come out in January 2009, Jameson elucidates three sites where the dialectics has persisted since its first modern flowering in the hands of Hegel. The first one, he tells us, involves thinking itself, the reflection on our own thinking apparatuses and the recognition of the historicity of our categories. The great practitioner here is, of course, Hegel himself. The second site, which presents itself in a more diachronic form, raises problems of causality and historical narrative and explanation. Marx would be the obvious master here. The third site involves the emphasis on contradictions, and the example Jameson gives is that of Bertolt Brecht. Fred Jameson's oeuvre is in his intellectual response to our profoundly anti-dialectical historical times is the continuation of the project in the three sites. When one thinks of his contribution to the first site, reflexivity, the first feature that comes to one's mind is his prodigious capacity for the invention of categories to think the contemporary. This takes either the form of coining new notions, meta-commentary, cognitive mapping, cultural logic, political unconscious are the most obvious examples, or it can take a more historic, historical turn and press into new uses terms like periodization, totalization, allegory, and crucially, utopia. But I think this reflexivity, or thought to the second degree, that includes the process and product of thinking, is best exemplified by Jameson's much commented style. In the preface to Jameson's The Geopolitical Aesthetic, which you quoted in your paper, uh, Colin McCabe states that the first encounter with Jameson's long and complex sentences in which the subclauses beat out complicated theoretical rhythms can be almost vertiginous. Terry Eagleton, in a perceptive essay about the politics of such style, rightly observes that the pleasure one derives from this exacting prose has to do with the excess or self-delight which escapes it, his extraneous analytical efforts. This excess, according to Eagleton, is the mark on the syntax that signals the impossibility and at the same time the wish for a mode of expression that would not be immediately subsumed as yet another academic novelty to be imitated by fashion followers. I would like to add, and I speak now both as a translator of some of his works into Portuguese, and as a professor who has read and discussed his books with students from Brazil and from a number of different nations, that the pleasure of Fred's style has certainly to do, as McCabe has it, with vertigo and also with a politics that takes its poetry from the future. But I would like to add to this the fact that his style is the materialization of the difficulty, but also of the corresponding exhilaration of thinking real thoughts in a thoroughly reified world where thought itself is most of the times just one more thing in an endless world of things. This style is at the service of the second site or mode of the dialectics, the one that has to do with historical narrative and explanation. Jameson is justly celebrated for a capacity that's very rare in our days of specialized judgments that is, the capacity of being able to elaborate valuable analysis of the conjuncture. It's here that a second defining feature of his theoretical practice can be more clearly discernible. To always historicize, one must add another related imperative, always totalize, 
Jameson himself explains that totalizing means little more than simply exercising the power of narratives and make connections where do not seem to be any. A totalizing approach is one that aims at formulating, and I quote him, the secret affinities between apparently autonomous and unrelated domains and of the rhythms and hidden sequences of things we normally remember only in isolation and one by one. Historical reconstruction then, the positing of global characterizations and hypotheses, the abstraction from the booming, buzzing confusion of immediacy becomes a radical intervention in the here and now and the promise of resistance to its blind fatalities. The double movement implicit in the conjunction of these two words, intervention and promise of resistance, indicates the main contradictions that underlie Jameson's historical analysis. They are powerful indictments of the constraints and impossibilities of the present. In the time-honored tradition of his acknowledged predecessors, the same one he studies is in his 1971 book, Marxism and Form, namely Georg Lukacs, Theodor Adorno, Walter Benjamin, Jean-Paul Sartre, Ernst Bloch, and Herbert Marcuse. But, and again restoring a fundamental impulse of their work, there is more than a diagnosis of the determined ailments of our times. Jameson's analysis aims at understanding the concrete determinants of our system as a means to promote change. This type of criticism is a form of disruption, a way of fostering a break that allows us to imaginatively construct an alternative to what is. As such, this criticism works as a means of escaping a future that is simply pre predicted as a prolongation of our damaged present. This properly utopian impulse seeks to neutralize what blocks freedom and to open up a space to resist the colonization of what is to come by the inevitabilities of the present. To this dialectics of the denun denunciation of the prison house of the present and of the necessity that creates of rattling the bars of hegemonic ideology and of working for the construction of an impossible but nonetheless essential space for hope, one must add another dimension. The extraordinary capacity this kind of thinking has of foretelling historical events, of practicing, to use his own words, an archaeology of the future. This is a characteristic which threads a line that unites his many analyses of the conjuncture. Together, those analyses form an intellectual project in their own right. We have learned with him that the spreading out of capital all over the world has created a new speciality, and those analyses configure a precise cartography in a world in urgent needs, need for reliable maps. The main landmarks of this cartography of the present include his 1984 essay, Periodizing the Sixties, his 1991 book, Postmodernism, or the cultural logic of late capitalism, and its companion volume, A Singular Modernity, which Professor Pike commented, which represents Jameson's caustic assessment of the false, pro pr uh, false promises of the neoliberal version of progress. The essays collected in the cultural turn round up the discussion by chartering the terrain for productive discussions on globalization. There is no time to do any justice to those works here, but in the light of the current economic crisis, and as you also mentioned this, I, I found it funny that we had the same quote, which is the end of his 1996 essay in the cultural turn called Culture and Finance Capital. And it ends like this, stereotypes are never lacking and neither is the total flow of the circuits of financial speculation. That each of these also unwittingly stirs towards a crash, and that was 1996. I must leave for another book and another time. But I do not want to finish this sketchy presentation of the political tenor 
of Jameson's criticism with the grim acknowledgement of his capacity to look into the seeds of time and foretell the distorted growth implicit in their present characteristics. I prefer to end as I began, back home. A number of Fred's books and essays have been translated into Portuguese. He has been to Brazil a number of times, the most recent one in July 2008 to give the keynote talk at an international conference organized by the Brazilian Association of Comparative Literature, the biggest literature association in the country with over 2,000 members. Of course, he's widely read and quoted in Brazilian academic circles, partly because there is, as, 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 as I outlined at the beginning, a tradition of dialectical criticism in Brazil and sadly, partly because he's a world-famous intellectual and it looks fashionable to quote him. But my favorite image of his many visits is not connected with the VIPs of Academy. In the year 2001, a number of NGOs and social movements organized the first World Social Forum in Porto Alegre in southern Brazil. The objective of the forum was to present a social alternative to the global themes discussed in the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Under the motto, Another World is Possible, the forum convened a large front of opponents of actually existing globalization. The forum seized the imagination of people all over the world. The first encounter had 2,000 participants, the third, only two years later, 100,000. Jameson was one of the speakers in a session that took place in one of the many tents specially put up for the 2003 event. He gave a moving talk on cultural intervention. After the talk, four young students, obviously enthused by what they just heard, asked Fred to take a photograph with them. As they all sat on the sidewalk to pose for the photo, I incongruously remembered Adorno's word in words in one of his last essays called Resignation. And the words are, if there is any chance of changing the world, it is only by undiminished insight. If cha change does ever come, and another world is made possible, Jameson's thought will certainly figure among its conditions of possibility. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Savasco, for a beautifully instructive discussion of the political unconscious and three vital elements of Jameson's cultural criticism. Um, narrative, uh, causality, contradiction, and so on. Thank you very much.